Welcome to First Mover, your first global look at today's action in the Bitcoin, blockchain, and digital asset space. I'm your host, Christine Lee, and joining me are my co-hosts, Quintus Managing Editor of Global Capital Markets, Lawrence Luton, as well as Managing Director of International Content, Emily Parker. Good morning, Emily, and good morning, Lawrence. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Well, Bitcoin's doing pretty well. I'm doing pretty well as well. All right, checking in at Bitcoin. Look at the, oh, it, it was over 50,000 just a second ago. Now it's dipping below, fighting with that resistance line. The Coinbase Bitcoin price, XBX index currently at $49,944. Bitcoin is still up about 4.5% over the past 24 hours. And the Coindesk Ether price ETX index is at 34.49. ETH also chugging ahead at 3% for the day. The new DFX, Coindesk's DeFi index, is at 593, pushing 600 almost, up about 1.8% over the past 24 hours. The most reliable reference prices for institutions since 2014 are now published under the Coindesk brand, trusted globally as the leader in crypto news events and data. So, Lawrence, we do see Bitcoin trying to go over $50,000, a bit of a selling pressure there, but but we are certainly seeing a bounce. Yeah, listen, you're going to get selling pressure at every big round number because that's just how silly markets work. Um, you know, we're seeing increased volume in Bitcoin. And what's interesting is that some of the volume is relative to other, other cryptocurrencies like ETH. You know, Kraken sent us a a message saying that they they were seeing two thirds um, of the volume in in Bitcoin versus uh, ETH. Uh, a few a few weeks ago, we were talking about how ETH uh, volumes were higher than Bitcoin. So clearly, it's a lot of movement inside Bitcoin itself. You know, with exchange seeing more volume and flows and things like that. But the the question is, um, why is this happening at a time? when gl global markets are, are starting to um, shake. And, mm -hmm. and that's something, you know, we, we're going to talk about later. But, um, you know, it's happening at a time when normally Bitcoin and the, and the markets, even though they, people like to say it's a hedge, they, they do move together. Right. Uh, well, there and there's global regulation to deal with in the crypto space. I, I'll just mention quickly that, you know, with Facebook going down, WhatsApp, Instagram, a little instability in Web 2.0. But on in terms of regulation, we do see some movement in that realm, Emily, right? Yeah, in some ways, what's happening is defying some of the, the myths about what moves crypto markets, because, you know, we have reports of stablecoin re regulation coming in the United States. We have a pretty serious crackdown in China and Bitcoin is just doing its thing, you know, briefly crossing $50,000. So I'd say that is a bullish sign about Bitcoin becoming more resistant to these fears of government regulation. All right. Speaking of which, we've got the Coindesk third quarter review that's out, summarizing some of the key themes and metrics that highlight the quarter's progress in the crypto markets. And joining us now to discuss further is Coindesk research analyst George Kaloudis. Hey there, George. Good morning. Congratulations on this new report. Really beefy findings. But what, what are some of the key takeaways from the report? Yeah, good morning, guys. And first off, shout out to my co-author, Teddy, who is diligently working behind the scenes to make sure this thing gets published on our website on time while I talk about it. Um, so it's always a really fun exercise to look back on a quarter when preparing these quarterly reports because the first thing that comes to mind is, wow, did anything even happen? And then it's quickly followed with, wow, so much has happened. How are we going to really fit this into one broad takeaway? So you guys talked about price a little bit. Lawrence touched on volume. And uh, I'd like to first say that from a price perspective, it felt as if Bitcoin and Ethereum were taking a, a collective breath following a quarter in Q2 where both hit all-time highs, but then came crashing down. You know, Bitcoin returned 25%, ending the quarter just below 44K, and Ethereum returned more than 30% in the quarter around 3k k which both look hilariously low as we enter october since that's proved to be you know october so far uh this quarter has come with a lot less volatility though which wouldn't really necessarily be surprising if you're looking at the space on a weekly basis because it did feel like we were just trading within this price band for basically an entire quarter and uh Lawrence, I think you touched, uh, were alluding to this earlier. That another interesting trend we saw was that Bitcoin was returned to returned to uncorrelatedness to the big macro assets the, uh, for the entire quarter. You know, Bitcoin spent 
the quarter uncorrelated to the S&P 500, bonds, gold, and the USD. And, and so that means like Bitcoin can claim its title back as a super unique asset. But as we show in, a, in our report, it's still tightly correlated to Ethereum, which shows that even if you are a digital asset investor with, with no Bitcoin exposure, and some reason you don't want to invest in Bitcoin and you want to invest in Ethereum and all these other Web3 projects, BTC is still something you need to pay attention to. It's still the, the big dog in the space. Um, and another takeaway from the quarter comes, again, from the Bitcoin world. Uh, following a Q2 crackdown from China, Bitcoin's hash rate fell and it, and it fell hard. But it actually grew over 40% during Q3, suggesting that miners either relocated or turned back on after a lack of enforcement by the Chinese government. And recently, the new crackdowns really cast doubt on that latter point, suggesting that Bitcoin successfully relocated a significant portion of its security infrastructure while experiencing no downtime, which is just absolutely crazy. Uh, so all this talk about the good stuff that happened in Bitcoin, there was an interesting stat that we focused on our report uh, and that was on Bitcoin, and I want to put quotes around this, losing dominance. So it was a measure known as a Bitcoin uh, dominance measure, which is just the Bitcoin market capitalization as a percentage of the entire crypto market's market capitalization. And Bitcoin has lost dominance the past three years. Uh, but Bitcoin losing dominance doesn't imply that it isn't losing, right? Especially as it continues to cement itself, cement itself as a sound money and global monetary network. This aligns with what we're referring to as uh, the scalability summer, since a lot of discussion was to be had this summer around Bitcoin and Ethereum and how we can scale it. Uh, in, in El Salvador, Bitcoin was adopted as legal tender with the Lightning Network as a scaling solution. And the NFT craze made transactions and gas fees on Ethereum high enough to spark a glut of alternative layer ones. Uh, but despite all of this, these two assets are still king. And in the world of, of Bitcoin, weighing dominance for Bitcoin more ac accurately suggests that there is money flowing into other projects with different use cases, which is what we typically see during times of optimism in digital assets. And that's not necessarily a problem. In fact, it's probably pretty exciting for the people at Coindesk. George, thank you so much. This is a fascinating report. I just want to turn to this question of correlations because, you know, you're saying that Bitcoin and, and the stock market are becoming less correlated, but there are clearly some exceptions to that. We saw that with fears over Evergrande in China when the uh, stock market went down quite dramatically in one day and, and Bitcoin seemed pretty correlated with that. There was a price drop in, in, in the crypto markets that many were um, saying were linked to the larger crash in the market. Um, now we have concerns about debt default, which could obviously negatively impact the stock market. I mean, what are some exceptions where we see Bitcoin correlating more with the S&P 500? Yeah, great question. And it's something that we actually have to wrestle with every day when we look at these assets. We like to think, uh, especially as sort of early adopters of Bitcoin, that Bitcoin is this, this huge asset that's going to completely uh, decoupled from everything that we already know now. And it's a, almost a trillion dollar asset. So you would maybe expect for it to have a life of its own, but whether we like it or not, if two of the largest economies are looking down the barrel of potential financial turmoil, there's just no way that it's not gonna touch every single asset. Now, in a world where Bitcoin may be a $10 trillion asset, $100 trillion asset, maybe this will be our saving grace in, in the true uh, flight to, to quality that we have when you know the US government's going to fail or the Chinese economy is just going to fall apart. But I'd say for now, Bitcoin is still an aspirational store of value looking to be uncorrelated in the longer term to uh, the other macro assets. This is still just one quarter where we saw the uncorrelatedness happen. If you see on the chart that's probably showing up right here, earlier in 2020, or actually Q3 2020 last year, we had more strong correlations, maybe not as strong as Ethereum, but it was affected by the other things in the market. George, it seems to be on the uptrend, though. In other words, the correlation between Bitcoin and the S&P 500 seems to be returning back above that band, that uncorrelation, uh, uncorrelated band, um, to becoming, would you say, a risk-on asset at that point? Uh, you know, if it, I mean, do you think Q4 will see us getting to to higher correlations between the the uh, stocks and 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 crypto? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I'd say that Bitcoin is risk everything at this point. I don't really know if it has an identity because you have, I'd say, a really loud amount of people saying that it's risk off and you have a loud amount of people saying it's, it's risk on. Um, in a world where bond yields are so low, 
Yeah, I guess you could say it's it's a risk on asset if it's going to become more correlated with S and P. I don't think that will continue going forward. I think it'll it'll try to continue its uh, uncorrelatedness going forward. It'd be really cool to see a brand new asset that's doing things we've never seen before. Uh, another key theme of your report, George, is that scalability was on everyone's minds, and so maybe talk a bit about that. And and what is the most scalable protocol? Uh, the, again, another interesting question it has a lot of deep layers to it. When we talk about scalability, especially in these these blockchain projects, you have to give up something in order to have you know fast and cheap transactions. In in, in the world of Ethereum, Solana came uh, from the depths to sort of take Ethereum's uh, pedestal as sort of this really fast, scalable blockchain. But they did that at the the uh, expense of decentralization. And in fact, Solana said they could do 40,000 transactions per second, but they went down for 20 hours. So there were many transactions happening during that time period. Uh, it also sparks an interesting conversation of how do we scale these things? Are we going to keep building alternative layer one blockchains that uh, can build bridges between the uh, blockchains, or are we going to have blockchains with significant layers on top of it? So Bitcoin seems to be taking the path of layering their uh, blockchains while the smart contract world is looking sort of like it's going to be a multi-chain world. Yeah, George, the answer uh, is, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> George, in the report, you were looking at volumes. You said they're, they're increasing. You also said liquidity is falling. Um, so can you explain what you mean by that and uh, how, how exactly that works and how, you know, how are you defining liquidity? Yeah. So Lawrence, you actually touched on this and you said that, so in Q2, uh, Ethereum volumes actually exceeded, uh, Bitcoin volumes and on exchanges. And this actually, that actually almost happened again this quarter, which is pretty cool. Um, Ethereum is really growing into being an, another investable asset for these big institutions. But when in our report, we we say that liquidity for Bitcoin is falling, and that's a measure of on-chain liquidity, which is a measure of the amount of quote-unquote liquid supply compared to the amount of illiquid supply. And all that means is there are people who hold Bitcoin on-chain and they don't move it. So that's a large percentage of the Bitcoin that's out there, and that's the illiquid supply. The liquid supply that makes up you know 10% of total supply is the stuff that's held by exchanges or held by people with paper hands who are fine selling and put, putting it in and out of the asset. So while liquidity is follow, falling on chain, there is still the, the highest level of brokerage, le, brokerage level liquidity uh, we've probably seen ever, right? You have new exchanges popping up every day. FTX is now the uh, darling child of all these exchanges. And I think if all of us right now wanted to take our collective net worths and put it into Bitcoin, we'd have no trouble buying it. So there's definitely not a liquidity problem on a brokerage level. It's more of people who hold Bitcoin are less willing to part with it now. Yeah, it's a complex story and you tackle it well, George. Thanks so much for giving us a preview. You can read the full thing, though, on Coindesk.com, Coindesk's quarterly review. Thank you, George, for coming on the show. That was Coindesk research analyst George Kaloudis. Coming up, checking in on Asia and crypto markets update with UK-based crypto asset broker Global Block. now for the daily forecast and update on what's happening in the Asia crypto markets. Here's Angie Lau of Forecast News. Welcome to the Daily Forecast, October 5th, 2021. I'm Angie Lau, Editor-in-Chief of Forecast News, covering all things blockchain. With massive uptake of play-to-earn games like Axie Infinity and excitement over decentralized finance, it should come as no surprise to find that Central and Southern Asia is leading innovation and adoption. We're going to take a dive into what's driving that growth and a whole lot more. Let's get you up to speed from Asia to the world. First up, research by global blockchain analytics company Chainalysis found 14% of the total value of global cryptocurrency transactions 
took place within Central and Southern Asia and Oceania in the year from July 2020 to June 2021. Forecast News' Lachlan Keller reports on why grassroots adoption is key to that growth. A few countries have been vital, with the region currently holding the three top spots in Chainalysis' Global Crypto Adoption Index, Vietnam, India and Pakistan. In the report, Bin Nguyen of the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology said that while gambling is illegal in Vietnam, it's still very popular and that may explain why so many people are willing to invest in high volatility assets like cryptocurrency. Lack of access to traditional banking services is also a possible reason. According to the World Bank, 190 million of the 1.4 billion people in India have no access to the financial system, while almost half of the population of Pakistan had no bank account in 2017. The report says decentralized finance apps, or dApps, have had a huge impact with transaction volumes now surpassing those of all other crypto service types. However, one expert told Forecast News, DeFi won't be the biggest driver over the next few years. GameFi is going to drive the crypto adoption in Southeast Asia, in South Asia. The, the blockchain games and the play-to-earn uh, uh, sector is what is going to take the adoption of non-crypto users and bringing them into crypto users. GameFi has already exploded in the Philippines. 20% of crypto wallet MetaMask's 10 million active monthly users live in the country. And it says growth there has been driven by the popularity of the NFT-based game Axie Infinity. For Forecast News, I'm Lachlan Keller. Meanwhile, over in South Korea, there's a national petition going on calling for crypto taxes to be put on pause, pushed back, delayed. Posted by an anonymous investor, the petition calls out Korea's finance minister saying his decisions are inconsiderate of the market and also inconsiderate of investors, not mincing words there. Forecast News' Danny Park reports. Korea's National Petition Board on the presidential Blue House webpage allows people to bring attention to significant matters. When a petition reaches 200,000 signatures, the government is obliged to answer. This petition asks for two things an extension of the grace period before taxation on crypto income, and fair taxation, saying the finance minister should prioritize investors and the industry. Levies on virtual asset gains are due to begin January 1st, but investors argue that date should be pushed back, citing lack of investor protection measures. Many also say it is unfair with crypto gains above 2.5 million won, or about 2,100 US dollars taxed, while stock capital gains are taxed from 50 million won. Hong Ki-young, professor at Incheon National University, told Forecast News that virtual assets are categorized as other income according to the international financial reporting standards. However, there is little to no inherent difference between income from virtual and financial assets. Hence, the topic of tax deduction and other benefits may be considered in the future. Meanwhile, ahead of the National Assembly's annual review, Finance Minister Hong Nam Ki said he will reinforce the ministry's infrastructure on crypto income taxation to prevent tax evasion. For Forecast News, I'm Danny Park. And finally today, TikTok has jumped into the NFT market. However, it chose to go kind of old school to do so. The China-based social media giant taking out a full page black and white text ad in the New York Times. Just last week, the social media platform announced that it has over 1 billion active monthly users worldwide. It's now leveraging content from some of its most popular creators to make a splash in the NFT world, with the first series from Lil Nas X set to drop on October 6th. In the ad, TikTok stated that it wants to be the platform that continues to, quote, find innovative ways to recognize and reward our creators except maybe for those uh, newspaper ads. And that's the daily forecast from our vantage point right here in Asia. For more, visit forecast.news. I'm forecast editor-in-chief Angie Lau. Until the next time. The Crypto Markets Update is presented by Grayscale, the world's largest digital currency asset manager. Checking in on Bitcoin, the Coindesk Bitcoin price XVX index is currently trading above 50,000 now. 50,082 Bitcoin up almost 5% over the past 24 hours. The Coindesk Ether price ETX index is at 34.53. ETH is also charging ahead about just above 3% for the day. And the new DFX Coindesk's DeFi index right now at 592. DeFi advancing about 1.7% over the past 24 hours. The most, And joining us now to discuss 
the crypto markets is Grant Whitlock, head of trading at UK-based crypto asset broker Global Block. Hey there, Grant. So Bitcoin hey is breaching $50,000. Where do we go from here? Oh, the $50,000 question. Um, the, the recent rally you know, since last Friday hasn't been on in, in, uh, too impressive volume. So the big thing is, can we get above this $52,500 mark, which was the recent high? Um, if we can get over that, then hopefully we're in this second bull run that lots and lots of people have been talking about. So, Grant, I'd actually, um, I disagree with what you said. I think this rally is really impressive given some of the, what's happening in the world, right? Like, for example, this massive uh, crypto crackdown from China or the extension of a crypto crackdown from China. I would say that Bitcoin's rally in light of that is actually rather impressive, right? Um, what do you think are the main drivers of that are bringing Bitcoin up in, in sort of recent days? Uh, so what I said was the volume wasn't in, that impressive, the fact it's gone, gone up. So... Um, you want to see on big moves, you want to see big volume, you know, a, conv a convincing move. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly it's, it's been a, an impressive move uh, in the price action. Personally, I thought um, we would have been a bit more correlated. Um, last Thursday, the stock markets around the world didn't have a great day and crypto was pretty flat. And then obviously a, a great move on Friday. But maybe this is the the movement, the, the, the second leg that we needed. I mean, COVID. 2020, um, you know, March 2020, we saw all assets drop across the world, you know, from commodities, bonds, stocks, and crypto. Um, that was the what three and a half thousand dollar low, and then from that, we've we went all the way to sixty four thousand dollars. So maybe this is the um, the catalyst for the the, the second uh, last quarter run that we're hopefully going to get. So Grant, do you think that this is? Uh, do you think that this lack of correlation you know, is the same question I asked George earlier? Do you think that it's temporary? Do you think that it's? Uh, um, but do you, or do you think that we're going to go back to being a risk on asset with with the markets and and in terms of what we have now with uh, w with prices going up and, and not being correlated with, with global equity markets? Do you think that that's sort of uh, a temporary uh, move because of, of very specific issues of money trying to flee uh, parts of the world where uh, they're having uh, specific problems? Um, yeah, I think if you get a stock market crash on a normal given day, I think you will see a retracement in the Bitcoin price. But eventually, it's, you know, the, the whole point was for it to be different, to be a, a different way of, of, you know, a digital money in the white paper, and it will have to decouple from the stock markets. Now, whether it then has an inverse relationship like gold, it, if it changes like that, um, time will tell. While we're talking about macro correlations, um, you know, one of the biggest topics in the U.S. right now are these fears of the U.S. defaulting on its debt for the first time. Um, do you, see, if, if that were to happen, do you see that as also having a massive impact on crypto markets, or do you see that? I mean, I know it's hard to predict, but do you see that would be an example of Bitcoin moving in tandem with with the stock market, or Bitcoin kind of serving as some sort of safe haven? I mean, I think you probably get a short term shock across everything, but eventually. This is, you know, a, a, a money, global money, a reserve currency that's free from government intervention. I'd see it as a positive for Bitcoin. <laughs> All right. Uh, Grant. The US default. All right, Grant, we'll leave it there. Thanks for joining us this morning. That was Global Block Head of Trading, Grant. Whitlock. Coming up, free DeFi courses for all at UC Berkeley and a look at the decentralized social media platform at platforms. Coindesk indexes, the market standard for crypto assets since 2014. Our trusted data powers billions in publicly traded funds. Coindesk indexes are the standard used by institutions, and they're the key for investors looking to understand and access crypto markets. As the company that launched the world's first ever Bitcoin ETF, we at Purpose chose the Coindesk Bitcoin Price Index, the XBX, to price our assets. Coindesk indexes enabled the early adopters to build crypto investment vehicles, and they're already trusted by a new generation of global investors. 
Welcome back. Well, if you want to learn about DeFi, UC Berkeley is offering a massively open online course, or MOOC, as they call it, on the subject. UC Berkeley ranks third in Coindesk's top universities for blockchain of 2021. Joining us now to discuss is Professor Don Song, one of the course leaders. Good morning, Professor Song. Thanks for waking up bright and early for us. So tell me a bit about what this course offers and why did Berkeley decide to offer it? Uh, yeah, this this class is the uh, first ever uh, DeFi MOOC class, uh, which uh, teaches a broad topic, a uh, broad spectrum of topics in decentralized finance DeFi. Uh, it covers uh, in uh, different topics, including the key DeFi building blocks such as stable coins, uh, decentralized exchange, decentralized lending, on-chain synthetics and derivatives, portfolio management, and also other more advanced topics such as uh, decentralized identity and also security and attacks and privacy as well. So for example, DeFi attacks have still over $1 billion uh, in 2021 alone. And uh, these are very important topics to cover. We teach the students why these attacks happen, what are the causes and what we can do to defend against them as well. And we'll also cover uh, some of the important issues on regulation also. And the so reason did... for, uh, right. Uh, right. So, so the reason that we offer this class is because, so first of all, right, so Berkeley is um, also the number one US university in blockchain. And so this is a really fascinating uh, area for innovation both in technology and also for potential huge societal impact. Um, but at the same time, there's also a lot of confusion in the space. So we thought it's a, a, a really important effort to uh, give students the exposure to learn more about this fascinating area. I think the general feeling in DeFi is because it moves so quickly, people just need to get out there and, and kind of learn while they're doing. What do you think is the most important thing that could be taught you know, to, taught in a course that, that you can't just learn from experiencing it yourself? Hmm. So that's a very good question. So uh, another unique uh, aspect of the class is that it's actually uh, a very interdisciplinary class. Uh, we actually have uh, co-instructors, including both from computer science as well as finance. And the class really provides a very systemic, uh, systematic view uh, of the field, when you go out, uh, um, you know, just experience yourself. Um, there's a lot of the more in-depth uh, knowledge. For example, how the designs of the different DeFi building blocks and protocols, how they work, and why they are designed one way versus another. What are the advantages and disadvantages of these de designs? So really, we are teaching the class more as an actual, you know, discipline or uh, 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 actually. Uh, uh, area of uh, study uh, that you can really go deep into understanding the principles and uh, the actual techniques and methodologies behind all these different applications that you may use uh, every day. Professor Song, how, how skilled or how, how much uh, background in either programming or in finance does one have to have uh, prior to taking the course? I mean, is it recommended that they have at least uh, some programming background, some finance background. How, how exactly, uh, what what sort of prerequisite classes or what sort of prerequisite would you suggest someone have prior to taking the course? Hmm. That's a very good question. So the class is really designed to be accessible uh, by the you know, general population of uh, students and learners. We also actually have uh, students and learners from uh, globally over 20 countries. And to make it uh, more accessible, actually, the first sec segment of the uh, of the class is on uh, introduction. So we provide introduction for uh, blockchain, smart contracts, and traditional finance. And then we go into the more uh, advanced topics and so on. So in general, uh, the class is also designed that even if you don't have as much background, you can. Uh, always learn something, but of course, the more background you have in computer science and in finance economics, the right. more you will get out of the class. Professor and Thong, also, yep, Professor Song, okay. thank you so much for joining us. And I see that the online class is free and open to everyone all over the world. And NFTs will be issued as certificates to those who complete the class. <laughs> thank you for joining us, Professor. That was U.S. Berkeley Professor Don Song. 
The Coindesk Spotlight is brought to you by Nexo, the place to earn on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and more. Diamond Hands, the pseudonymous founder of controversial social media site BitCloud, is now naming the blockchain the app runs on. It's called DSO, or Decentralized Social, a blockchain that's already raised $200 million in financing from the likes of Andreessen Horowitz, Coinbase Ventures, Sequoia, and others. Well, now Diamond Hands has revealed his identity, and he joins us now. Welcome, Nader al Naji, founder of BitCloud and now DSO. So, Nader... Bill Clout is trying to put social media on the blockchain. The app launched in March and users can issue their own creator coin, which other users can buy into. And the more that people like your content, the more valuable your coin will become in theory. And it's an interesting concept, but the rollout was highly criticized. So are you essentially rebranding BitCloud as DSO to start anew and shed the bad associations? Well, thank you, Christine, for having me on the show. Uh, just as context for your viewers, um, the DSO is the first blockchain that's custom built from the ground up to scale social applications to over 1 billion users. And it currently supports over 100 apps that have been built on it in the last six months, uh, which is just incredible and unprecedented developer traction. Uh, BitCloud, the app that you're talking about, uh, is kind of a prototype app that we launched, uh, and I actually launched it pseudonymously as Diamond Hands. Um, but it's one of over 100 now, and there are a lot that are launching soon. And in fact, there was so much developer traction with so many apps being built on it so early that we actually decided to launch a formal developer fund. Um, and it's actually a $50 million fund called the Octane Fund that we're launching today. And the exciting thing about that is it presents a completely new model for building out social media. For example, just, just yesterday we saw with the Facebook outage, how heavily we've come to rely on a single entity for our information needs. Um, and uh, you know, really until now, there's only been one way to build uh, social media apps, namely with central planning. So essentially a large, large, large private company that controls the content. Uh, and we think that instead of central planning, um, you can have the content be a utility uh, rather than a privately held monopoly. And you can have thousands of apps built by thousands of developers all on an open pool of content and that's what we hope to enable with DSO, the blockchain, and now the Octane Fund, this $50 million fund that we're announcing today. So Diamond Hands, when you, when you launched Clout, though, there were a bunch of basically fake celebrity profiles that were created without their consent. Now, is that necessarily what decentralization is? I mean, if I go on and then there were people who were going on there and saying, wait, why is my person why is my profile up there? Why is it being bid on and I have no control over it? Um, you know, how, how does that, you know, how many first of all, how, the other question is how many profiles do you have like that where that were created for other people without them knowing about it, without them consenting to it? Is is that really what what's going on here? Is that really what decentralized a decentralized platform will look like? Well, what, what you're referring to is when BitCloud launched, um, it had actually reserved profiles for the top 15,000 users from Twitter who, who uh, reserved loaded them? onto the blockchain beforehand. And the reason for that was really to prevent squatting and impersonation of those profiles. Um, but just to go back to your broader question, um, you know, I think today we live in a world where uh, social media is on a highly, highly centralized part of a spectrum. So if you think of a spectrum of total uh, centralization on one end and total anarchy on the other, you know, we're on the total, totally centralized part of the spectrum. There's three companies that control the vast majority of the information that we see today. Uh, but just, you know, just to be very clear, we think the other end uh, of total anarchy is also untenable. There's a lot of content that actually is harmful that you do want to, um, you know, screen out and things like that. Uh, and so with DSO, the blockchain, what we think the right model for content is, having thought about it for over two years myself, uh, is something more in the middle. Um, and so the blockchain, the DSO blockchain, contains all of the content that powers all of the apps built on top of it, uh, like BitCloud. But it's up to those apps to make decisions about moderation and what uh, content should and shouldn't be shown. And to your point about reserved profiles, that was a decision that we made with the BitCloud app but it doesn't apply to other apps. So for example, a lot of apps only show profiles that have actually been claimed uh, or that are even more stringently verified and things like that. Um, and they do that because that's how they maximize usage and adoption. But, you know, listen, you get somebody who's like a, a D-list celebrity like myself. Um, you know, we, we don't necessarily have a big cloud uh, profile on there. We don't have a, another app 
uh, profile on there now. But you go on and then you're like, okay, you know, I want to, if somebody might potentially squat on it, right, and you haven't reserved it, then what's my recourse? Yeah, I mean, so up first, I'd give yourself a little more credit than that. <laughs> uh, All right, see list, sure. But, yeah, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but no, so um, if there's, you know, again, we reserve profiles for the top 15,000 people from Twitter and loaded those onto the blockchain. But if you don't have a profile, you can create one and um, you can have the same benefits as, and you know, like create a coin associated with your profile uh, when you post. And again, maybe just to go back, because Viso is a blockchain, it offers all kinds of features that you could never really do in a centralized fashion. Uh, and we call them investment uh, native or money native features. Um, and so the big feature you're referring to is having a coin associated with your profile that all other users can buy and sell and you earn fees off of that. Uh, many, many, many users, I think many, many dozens of users have earned hundreds of thousands of dollars just on the fees associated with their uh, with their profile uh, and the coin associated with their profile alone. Uh, but there are many other features. So for example, uh, NFTs are native to the DSO blockchain. People have made hundreds of thousands of dollars on that. There's actually a clout punk um, NFT series that I believe has made over $400,000 uh, just from that. Um, and then of course there's diamonds, which are very, very popular. And so when you make a post on a, on a DSO uh, app like BitClout, um, you can actually get uh, tips associated with the post called diamonds. And that's anywhere from a penny to a thousand dollars, and people make hundreds to thousands of dollars a week just from the diamonds feature alone. Um, and so, what you're seeing is all of this money-enabled or investment-enabled uh, product that's being created, BitCloud being an early prototype. Uh, and so, even for you as someone who doesn't have a reserved profile, you can make much, much more than what you would ever make on another social network, which is probably zero. By the way, it's zero even if you're an A-list celebrity on another network. So. So I just want to kind of bring up a larger philosophical question, kind of uh, talk, go, going off of what Lawrence just said. So, you know, on the one hand, you would think that the timing for this is perfect because, you know, Facebook is in another scandal. You know, there's so much controversy over Twitter and Trump, for example. But, you know, the, the, the problem is, is that everybody complains about social media platform too much power. But then when something goes wrong, they do want the social media platforms to come in and fix it, right? So, you know, this idea of like a totally decentralized social media is, is problematic in the sense that like, what happens when people are posting, you know, fake news, slander, hate speech, you know, I mean, it's, it's just, it just stays there forever. And, you know, if you look at Twitter, I think a lot of people actually support, for better or worse, Twitter taking down Trump's uh, account, you know, people wanted Twitter to do that. So how do you deal with those issues where like, you know, you have, um, you know, market forces creating content that some people really don't think should be up? It's a great question. So I've, I've spent over two years working on this, on this technology and moderation, which is what you're referring to is probably the thing that I've thought the most about and how we solve that problem and make it better than it is today. Um, and so uh, when you look at today uh, and you look at the fact that these private companies essentially control all of the content, um, there's actually a lot of disadvantages to that, which is that we basically rely solely on them um, to watch, for example, the spread of misinformation, to use machine learning to label harmful content. Uh, and they're not really aligned to do that, right? They're aligned to make money on ads, which often they make more money spreading misinformation than from actually finding it and, and killing it, right? Which is literally what we saw uh, with, with all the recent elections. Um, and so what you find is that when you actually put all the content on an open blockchain, suddenly the entire world can be involved in uh, moderating the content and also analyzing the content. So for example, you can have the best mach machine learning researchers in the world building models to find harmful content, which is something that you can't do today when it's all closed. Uh, and on top of that, you can even have uh, watch the spread of misinformation much, much more closely than you can today. For example, even the federal government could be involved in and watching how misinformation is spreading throughout the network when it's open. And it all com comes back to content being a utility rather than a privately controlled monopoly. And when content is a utility, uh, we really believe that all of the benefits that you get from using the entire world's ingenuity uh, to, to moderate it uh, outweigh the negatives of it being more open, if that makes sense. Diamond Hands, you said you raised about $200 million in cash, right? Um, or $200 million. Was that in cash or was that through coin? I, like, how did you raise that money, the $200 million, And how much of that, how much of the $50 million that you're now using as an investment fund came from that $200 million? It's a great question. So um, DSO essentially is a project that I've been working on since early 2019. I actually worked on it 
without telling anybody for uh, almost two years. And so in late 2020, um, we formally launched the blockchain. It was running on a few dozen nodes. Uh, and the blockchain had a feature where essentially you could send Bitcoin to a treasury wallet uh, and get DSO coins as a result. Um, and so that's really the same mechanism. Uh, that, that's the mechanism that uh, all the big venture capitalists that Christine mentioned went through. It's also the same mechanism that all ordinary people went through to buy a DSO. So there were over 44,000 purchases through that mechanism. Uh, and so, so uh, that, bit, that is Bitcoin in a treasury wallet. Uh, and now uh, we have a formal and public structure around it via the DSO Foundation, which uses that capital uh, to grow the decentralized social ecosystem. And the first really major act for the DSO Foundation is the creation of this $50 million octane fund. And it will use the, the proceeds from that uh, treasury to, so, to fund that. So how, how much of that actually, uh, of that 200 million actually came from venture capital? Like how, how much of the, the uh, Bitcoin that, that you guys received in your wallet, how much of that was from, you know, let's say Andreessen and Horowitz, how, it, it, you know, how much did they actually contribute versus the masses? Yeah, so the, the awesome thing about uh, the, the blockchain is that um, you don't have to ask me, you know, in order to, to essentially get hold of DSO. And that's why there were, we were able to even have so many people involved, over 44,000 purchases. Um, that said, um, you know, I, I did speak with a few of the people who, who put money into, uh, into the, pl the protocol. Uh, and so I, I would estimate that it's maybe under 40 million, um, you know, that actually came from VCs. And the rest is actually people like, uh, like you and me. Mm -hmm. And the native cryptocurrency cloud powers the DSO blockchain. Did your investors receive tokens for money in expectation of a profit? Uh, well, so the, the token is actually called DSO. Uh, so the, there's the DSO blockchain and then there's the DSO uh, coin, um, which you can buy on blockchain.com or Ascendex, uh, which are two crypto exchanges that list it uh, with a really big uh, listing coming soon. Um, and so, uh, you know, really... Our, our philosophy, you know, you, you'll have to talk to the lawyers for the, oh, uh, you know, expectation of profit and things like that. Uh, but the network was fully launched uh, before anybody put any money in. Um, and so, uh, you know, the way we think about it is in the same way that you might use your CPU power to mine and get Bitcoin, uh, which you can do even today, uh, instead of burning CPU, you burn Bitcoin to get ESO. Uh, and so there's an analog there that, that um, I think we're comfortable with. Is there any concern that's a security? Uh, well, you know, the SEC, you know, has to weigh in on, you know, actual guidance on what is and isn't a security, of course, and you have to talk to the lawyers about that. Uh, but I will say we work with the best law firms in the entire world. And additionally, uh, you know, many people don't know from my last company called Basis, I actually raised $140 million for that company. And when it turned out that we couldn't do things in a compliant fashion, um, I actually returned the money rather than do something that would be uh, regulatorily uh, risky uh, or, or on the edge. Um, and so, uh, like, you know, with, with DSO, we did it from the ground up. Uh, again, we have the best counsel. We have memos and opinions and all that stuff. So, uh, you know, I'm very well, Nader, comfortable with everything that we're doing. It's a super ambitious project. And as you see from Facebook, uh, it, it is riddled with uh, challenges and barriers ahead <laughs> when dealing with social media. Thank you for joining us. That was Nader al Naji, founder of BitCloud on the DSO blockchain. All right, that's it for First Mover. Thank you, Emily Parker, as well as Lawrence Lewitton. I'm your host, Christine Lee. I'll be back live at 3 p.m. with all about Bitcoin. Coming up at noon is The Hash. You're watching Coindesk TV.